You know, that's a nice tie, Roger Stone. Nice suit. I bet, did Putin help you put that on? Because everybody knows he helps us shave in the morning. America couldn't vote and get Trump. We couldn't do anything. We couldn't, you know, go expose his illegitimate black son and get the black vote. We didn't have any effect. You didn't have any effect. You don't have a best-selling book, The Making of a President. America's never succeeded before. Why, I mean, you've heard Maxine Waters. Trump had to be given the term uh, crooked Hillary from Putin because Trump couldn't think of her being crooked himself, could he? Yeah, and Alex, you were exactly right on election night when you said to me, this isn't, the, this isn't the end, this is just the beginning. In fact, the biggest fight is ahead of us. You are absolutely right. The two-party duopoly and the establishment simply will not accede to the democratic election of Donald Trump and let him exercise his constitutional authority to reform our government and to uh, uh, make America great again. They are going to resist this at every level, including breaking the law if it's necessary, including the illegal monitoring of U.S. government officials and the leaking of that information, which is, of course, a felony. Precisely what's happened here in the case of General Flynn. And just to be clear, I've been covering politics 20 years, but I grew up getting mother's milk during the, you know, when you were there in the Nixon administration, watching the, uh, you know, whole hearings in Congress. I, everybody knows that an incoming group talks to all the diplomats and back and forth, and that it's a president's sovereign purview as a separate branch of government to go sign treaties with the Russians if he wants, then Congress has to ratify. I mean, the president can do whatever he wants with the Russians, then it gets judged by us, the voters. This idea that it violates the Logan Act, the, the TPP with Hillary and Obama secretly negotiating with private corporations the deal without Congress and not letting them have a copy, that's treason. The head of state with his designates communicating with other heads of state is the exact purview of the chief executive. No, this is extraordinary. Uh, it is entirely appropriate for General Flynn to uh, make contact with the Russians to set up uh, you know, a, an initial congratulatory call uh, between the pr new president uh, and the head of the Russian state. We know from the transcripts that there was no substantive discussion of sanctions. Uh, and we know from a review by the White House Counsel's Office that General Flynn violated no laws. This was typical inside the Beltway lynching. This is Prevost, and let's just say it, and I like him. It's the vice president. It's the big Republican establishment swinging their wee-wees around. Yeah, there's no question about it. And as uh, Dr. Corsi wrote today at InfoWars, is exactly right. The game plan here is very simple. Purge the Trump loyalists. First General Flynn, then the very capable Stephen Miller, and then finally the president's chief issues man, Steve Bannon. The problem here for them, for the Republican establishment, is that we Trump loyalists are not going to stand for it. There is zero chance we will let this happen. And if we have to mobilize the grassroots to make sure the president knows we have his back, I'm prepared to do so, and I know you are as well. I get why he had to bring Priebus and them in, because that's a big system to run. He wanted to work with them, but there's such, and then Ryan gets on TV and says, I'm gonna work with him. He looked like a weasel, like Eddie Haskell when he said it. And now we know Priebus is the leaker on a lot of this stuff. It's come, even mainstream media, and I know we have sources, who've talked to the little guy. So he better, I mean, you know, here's the deal. We're just going to get a data package together, obviously, everybody, but do it through Twitter, you name it. The public, it's not just Roger and I, he hears the public. And I'm doing a big story on this tonight. It's confirmed for two weeks, no one's allowed to get in the Twitter feed where he can read it, but hundreds down. They block it. So he doesn't see your link, doesn't read your article, doesn't retweet you. OK, they're trying to cut him off. OK, and so they don't even let you uh, get to the president now. They only put haters up at the top. And Priebus has been meeting with Twitter. This is all a disgusting little action. So this is incredible. They're trying to cut Trump off from the American people. And it's disgusting. And it's an example of how controlled this is. If they can censor and hijack the president's feed and it's not even in the news, then, folks, imagine what else is going on. I remember a month ago, they said, let's ban the president off Twitter. Roger, it's where does really, this go? No, it's really extraordinary, Alex. You know, I, I pick up the paper and I read that the president's son-in-law, Jared Kushner, who I have a very high regard for, is 
meeting with the captains of, of Silicon Valley as if they are our friends. Let's be very clear. Google, particularly, Facebook, sought to undermine Donald Trump in this campaign, fiddled with their SEO to try to bury uh, uh, bad news about Hillary Clinton, elevate any criticism of Donald Trump. These folks are not our friends. Again, Dr. Jerry Corsi has done extraordinary research into Google's efforts to infiltrate this administration so they can have the kind of advantages and the kind of inside uh, fix on the issues they care about that they enjoyed under eight years of Barack Obama. The Silicon Valley crowd, the Wall Street crowd, the inside the Beltway lobbyist culture, uh, and the establishment Republican Party are not our friends. They are not part of the Reagan, pardon me, of the Trump revolution. Little Freudian slip there. Uh, they are they are doing everything possible they can to foot drag. And now I'm increasingly concerned that Reince Priebus is inserting himself into the selection of ambassadors is going to give us people who are unqualified. As Dr. Corsi broke the news today, Priebus circumvented the State Department, violated a commitment that was given to the Secretary of State, Rex Tillerson, that he would have the ability to interview the candidates for the absolutely strategically key embassies. And instead, now those jobs are going to RNC. He should be fired Act. right there. He's off. He's off the Republican Party donors. That, that Trump got none of the money from. He doesn't want their money. He's kicking them out of politics. Why the hell are all these these all these peacocks, all these narcissists that want to go stand around at embassies and act like they're fancy pants and have these stupid parties? Why are all these wannabe Thurston Howell the thirds even being allowed in? Well, we only minutes ago we got word that the uh, nominee for Secretary of Labor, Andy Puzder, is withdrawing his name. Where did his name come from to begin with? I can answer that in two words. Reince Priebus. And by the way, that's see how we're on target. See how that's in Corsi's uh, headline. I just trust Corsi. Three number one New York Times bestsellers. All of his key deals absolutely upsetting two elections. I don't know his sources, but he's been in D.C. He's moved there, back there. He's at these meetings, and he said that it is incredible what's going on with Priebus. And there is no doubt. There is, if we'll put his article on screen, there is no doubt that Priebus is one of the prime leakers. Here it is, Priebus next to go as Trump strikes back over Flynn. I talked to some of my uh, folks that are connected in to the intelligence agencies. And again, I, I'm not with an intelligence agency. I'm an independent American citizen. Most of the intelligence agencies are totally against the globalists because they're sick of it. They want America back. So the, you know, all they're doing is confirming or denying info for me, so I know. But they say that uh, it looks like the fate of Priebus is still not known. I guess that's in Trump's brain. Well, in, in an odd sense, while the uh, Flynn ouster may be a catalyst, it may be the beginning of the dominoes that end with the fall of Mr. Priebus, they have also run interference because this is a much bigger story than the mismanagement of the White House uh, and the leaking uh, of information from White House staffers that make the president look foolish. Yeah, let's be clear. That Chris Ruddy got called up by high-level players, as high as they go except the president, and told, please backtrack on this. And I'm not going to get into the rest of it, but, uh, I mean, that th th that went on. He admitted that happened. Yeah. I, on the other hand, I still don't think this will stand. It is my understanding that Reince Priebus and Steve Bannon, who I have a very high regard for and have defended in a dozen forums from the outrageous attacks on him that he is an anti-Semite or a bigot or a nativist, all those things are false. Uh, they're doing these joint press, uh, these joint telephone calls with reporters, telling them how much they love each other and how they work so closely together. These are like hostage videos, Alex. They're being forced to say those things. At least in this case, I think Bannon is. He's a good man, but he ought to be aware that he is on Priebus's target list next right after the very capable Stephen Miller. Well, it's funny, you know, they have the public policy uh, kind of foreign affairs branch, the Washington Post came out and admitted an article we covered a lot the last few days that, okay, Trump's really for real, he's a nationalist, he wants prosperity. America's gonna take over the whole globalist system, basically, and Russia better watch out, because globalists were gonna work with Russia, but Trump's actually just gonna be totally dominant. 
So we hope the Russians understand that. And they admit that Bannon and Trump and everybody just want Americana and good deals for us. And the truth is, if we just get these deals before they can plunge the economy, it's game over. We're going to dominate everybody. I mean, give me a break. China's tottering on the edge of collapse. So why doesn't the globalists just get out of the way and let the United States of America dominate? Here's what really bothers them, Alex. They realize that we could be on the verge of peace. In, in Vladimir Putin and Donald Trump, you have two very, very tough guys, two very stubborn guys, two guys who have the best interests of their respective countries at heart. I am convinced that if Brezhnev and Nixon can hammer out an agreement on the strategic arms limitations, then Trump and Putin can make a deal for peace. And the bureaucracy admits they don't want that, and, and, and they admit that Russia wants to do deals and not get bankrupted by a new Cold War. We don't want to be bankrupted by one. There'll be plenty of defense spending, plenty of issues. It's ridiculous. We shouldn't sit here because the neocons want to reconquer Russia because Trotsky got kicked out, and they've still got a hard-on for the Russians because they got to kill so many of them. They're bloodthirsty for them. I, I think we all know what this is really about. Hillary Clinton had promised the boys at Langley and the folks at the Pentagon that they would have a wider proxy war in Syria. They were licking their chops over a no-fly zone. God, we could get World War III. Wouldn't that be great? This is how the neocons think. Donald Trump has no intention of going out and provoking an unnecessary And by the way, war. the Pentagon, the Pentagon. It was, it was one that helped block the neocons on this. And let's take Netanyahu. They claim out with the neocons. Netanyahu's even signaling he doesn't want big wars and wants to stop this. What does that mean? Well, because, I, I, look, he is another leader who has the best interests in his, of his country at heart. War is good for no one other than the defense contractors and many of Hillary Clinton's biggest donors to the Clinton Foundation. Steve Pachinik with his sources, and again, I have mine as well. The, 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 they say, look, this is like babies throwing fits. Uh, you know, everybody's saying kill Trump, overthrow him. Uh, he's, you know, the press conference is saying he's a Russian agent. It's going nowhere. Well, then why get rid of Flynn when Trump, even today, when Netanyahu said, oh, I like him, you know, Flynn's a great guy. Why have, you know, the press secretary say, well, it was a trust issue and he just didn't tell him the truth. When he said, no, we didn't substantively discuss sanctions. The Russians just said they wanted to talk about sanctions with the president. That's what, a, that's what you do as the national security advisor. Yeah, it's, it's agenda setting. This was very sadly uh, uh, a typical inside the beltway lynching. General Flynn, who is, a, a, I think, a great man and a great patriot and a man who understands the dangers of, ex of Islamic uh, uh, terrorism, uh, has been pushed out over what could have been contained. He broke no laws. He acted appropriately. Uh, he merely had to to uh, apologize to the president for a protocol breach, and we could have moved and on. You told me that yesterday. It looked like Trump got stampeded like Priebus does, where he calls people in, says they're fired. The person gets depressed, goes in and resigns. And it kind of says like he was told, so he resigned and went and apologized. And Trump looked like today he got he wasn't playing good cop, because I know from people that have said he doesn't play good cop, bad cop. He'll fire you if you're really firing you. He's like, well, Flynn's a really great guy. Too bad this happened. Almost like he wasn't behind that. Yeah, perhaps the president is looking at all the facts and the whirlwind of the last 48 hours, and, and uh, he's come to that conclusion. Look, I also don't think Sean Spicer is doing the president any good. By the way, Trump called it a criminal attack on a wonderful man. Trump ramps up war on his own spies as he rages against Democrats, leakers who he legally brought down, disgrace Mike Flynn. Yeah, in fact, I was heard this from Little Birds, and now it's pretty much confirmed by this. They stampeded him just like they tried with, can I say the other guy's name? You know, in the meetings where they say, you, you, you've you got to resign. And then he goes, I want to talk to the president. And it's not true. Ant Anthony Scaramucci, well thought of in conservative and Trump supporter circles, hanging in limbo, even as we speak, appointed a liaison uh, to the business community by the president, but yet to be sworn in. Again, Reince Priebus is jealous of the fact that Anthony Scaramucci has a direct personal relationship with the president and can communicate with him. That was his same problem with General Flynn. Mr. Priebus would like to be the source of all information for the president. And that shows he doesn't know Donald Trump. Well, it's clear Donald now, it, it, it all just crystallized with Trump's statements and everything.
it was a previous, they admit it. They went to Flynn, and basically the vice president went to him, and they, they said, okay, you're bad. And Flynn said, okay, I haven't done anything wrong, but if I miss, if I didn't answer perfectly here, I just resign. It looks like they manipulated him into resigning, but maybe it'll turn out good. But I, I just, and now Trump is on. I've never seen, he's like, Flynn's really wonderful. He He's a great guy. This is horrible. This happened. This, this looks really bad. Well, look, I'm hoping that General Flynn remains in the public eye, remains in public life, and will continue speaking out because I think he still has a very valuable role to play. Uh, and then, Alex, uh, this, this whole week gets topped off by picking up the newspaper this morning and reading, in order to coincide with this Flynn flap, the New York Times essentially recycled their story from June 20th, reiterating again the completely bogus in false allegation that Paul Manafort, my former partner, chairman of the Trump campaign during the summer and into the convention, and that I were continuously in communication. Page. It's continuously is the headline at CNN, continuously in communication with the Russians. And Manafort says, I'm boggled. I talked to no one. No, look, my wife called minutes ago. She saw my photo flash up on CNN and she said, wait a minute. You didn't talk to any Russians, did you? And you know the answer. Absolutely, categorically not. I spoke to no Russians, no intermediaries for the Russians, no representatives of the Russians. I have no Russian clients, no Russian contacts, no Russian money, and I have never spoken to anybody in Russia. Here's what's happening. Russia. They're targeting everybody they know are good advisors off the record to Trump and saying they've been spotted as potential Russians. You can't talk to them now. And oh, Flynn's a Russian, and now Michael Moore says Trump's a Russian. And at a certain point, this this he's the president. He can talk to whoever he wants. This is a load of horse manure, and he's got to just go ahead and just point out it is and start an investigation of Hillary with the Saudi Arabians and commie Chinese. I think the answer is the offense. I'm going to turn the baton over to you, my friend, but your book's available at InfoWarsStore.com. We have a new caveman bone broth supplement, chocolate flavor, the, the total game changer. Check that out, folks. But Roger, I mean, what does Trump do? Doesn't he go on the offense? He needs to not only go on the off lens, Alex, but he needs to clean house. He needs to clean house at the White House. There are many, many capable Republican operatives who were for Donald Trump from the beginning, who sacrificed to help get him elected, who are more than capable of handling these mechanical jobs at the White House. There are many fine people who could be assistant secretaries and deputy secretaries in the departments who are capable individuals who supported Donald Trump from the beginning, who share his worldview. We need to repopulate this administration. Absolutely, and just get rid of the Paul Ryan tentacle, Mr. Penis, excuse me, Mr. Priebus. We'll be back. Roger Stone takes over. Now it's night, 7 o'clock Central. Welcome back to InfoWars. Uh, I have just picked up the torch from the great Alex Jones for the balance of hour. Uh, and joining me now is Andrew Kerr of the Citizens Audit. Talk about one of my favorite subjects, a weasel that we need to keep our eyes on very carefully, and that is the former conservative flip-flop artist and liberal hitman, David Brock. Now, Mr. Brock uh, fronts a number of organizations that he claims are monitors of the media or, or monitors of public, public ethics. But in fact, these are all propaganda organizations designed to cover up the many crimes of Bill and Hillary and Chelsea Clinton uh, into hurl invective and personal insults, smears, as it were, against anybody who has the courage to speak out against the Clintons or the political status quo in Washington. I estimate that Mr. Brock probably burned through perhaps 30 to $40 million in the last election, having absolutely, positively nothing to show for it. Now comes Amazing new research by Dr. Jerome Corsi showing that Brock is in bed with both Google and Facebook attempting to censor critics of the Clintons and advocates for President Trump. So to help us keep an eye on what illegal activity Mr. Brock is involved in now, Andrew Kerr joins us from Citizens Audit. Welcome, Andrew, to uh, Infowars.com. Thanks, Roger. It's an honor to be speaking with you right now. So you have done some extraordinary work, uh, and I uh, always enjoy reading the updates on your site. Tell our listeners 
who Mr. Brock is, where he came from, and what he's done. He's a, like you say, he's a former conservative uh, author. Um, he, he wrote the true story of Anita Hill um, back in the early 90s. And he was uh, commissioned to essentially write a hit piece on Hillary Clinton, or, yeah, on, on the Clintons in, um, in the late 90s. And he came out of that being a staunch ally of them. He did a total ideological switch, um, ended up founding an organization called Media Matters for America, um, a, a supposed watchdog, a conservative media watchdog, information fact checker. And since then, uh, he's, he's got a total of, uh, of 14 entities that he's running out of his office space, a variety of uh, supposed nonprofits, foundations, uh, and super PACs. Uh, that were uh, working directly with the the Clinton campaign during this previous election season, and yeah, he probably did burn through a you know thirty or forty million dollars. And just a couple of weeks ago, he was asking for another forty million dollars from his network of donors, um, you know, for, for round two. Now that you know, now that Trump is in power. Well, uh, I evidently his manifesto leaked. Um, I've seen a copy of it. Uh, Dr. Corsi's seen a copy of it. I know you have seen a copy of it. It's quite grandiose. He takes enormous credit for things that, in fact, he had nothing to do with. Uh, it's amazing to me that based on my calculation, uh, Bill and Hillary Clinton probably sent, spent upwards of $2 billion uh, in their efforts to seize the White House. Uh, the cost of the mainstream media coverage of the campaign, which was really one long Hillary Clinton commercial, um, that in itself is millions of dollars. Now you figure in the manipulations of Facebook, the manipulations of Google. It's really a miracle that Donald Trump won, given all that he faced. Uh, I am under the impression that based on a very comprehensive and well-drafted complaint at the Federal Election Commission, that Mr. Brock has broken multiple laws, that he has been shuffling money between nonprofit entities, hard money entities, uh, and so on. I know this, if I did this, or if you did, Andrew, we'd already be in jail. Exactly, and, and, and that's the problem, is that we have uh, Media Matters for America is, is a charity. It's, a, um, it's supposed to be a charitable organization. And here's a snip from their fundraising document from a couple weeks ago. Media Matters has already secured access to raw data from Facebook, Twitter, and social media sites. We will now develop technologies and processes to systematically monitor and analyze this unfiltered data. So they have a, they have a line into social media sites in order to review the data, analyze it, data mine it. And here's what they plan to do with it. This is their top outcomes. Over the next four years, Media Matters will focus on exposing serial misinformers and right-wing propagandists inhabiting everything from social media to the highest levels of government. Uh, internet and social media platforms will no longer uncritically and without consequence host and enrich fake news sites and propagandists. So what they're saying is, you know, it's one thing to go after Roger Stone, which they have, uh, and we'll get to that in a second. But it's not, what they're saying is that they're gonna go after individuals on social media if they determine those people to be serial misinformers. And we have to ask ourselves, is that what a charitable organization should be doing? We have people that are donating money and they're deducting that from their, uh, from their tax returns. And they also talk about, they, they brag about how they targeted you, Roger, saying that we put pressure on CNN, MSNBC, and Fox News. And due to our pressure, they stopped booking Roger Stone on their shows. So. These shows wanted to have you on, and then Media Matters came in and said, no, his views are unacceptable. Don't book him anymore, or we're going to put pressure on you. We're going to, we're going to uh, put pressure on advertisers to stop booking with you um, in an effort to silence you. Instead of allowing you to, uh, to debate and you know, let the merits of your ideas and thoughts, you judge what you're saying. They, just, they want to silence people that are saying things against uh, the, the status quo that they want out there. And yeah. you were speaking to Alex Jones before about Twitter. Uh, if you look at uh, Donald Trump's Twitter and 100% of the replies, it's all negative. Even though all of his tweets get you know, 50, 60, 70,000 likes, but Media Matters has raw access to Twitter's uh, data and 
uh, it, it shouldn't be a stretch of the imagination that they're pressuring Twitter to filter the, uh, the, the view on the site to show only negative comments to Trump, creating this false illusion that 100% of Americans are against Trump. So perspectives of pro-Trump supporters are just not being seen by the greater media or, or by the population. And then we get into the situation where you know, uh, there's millions of people, millions of Americans that believe that everybody that voted for Trump is a Nazi racist uh, xenophobe, which is just not true. Well, I think they've actually made a mistake because you see the president follows his Twitter feed religiously. Uh, and he's a highly intelligent, in fact, brilliant man who will quickly realize that the responses are being manipulated. So I think this will open a window to a broader understanding of what Brock and the extreme left are up to. As far as um, their successful efforts to censor me in some kind of Stalinistic like censorship, in all honesty, I would never have met and affiliated with InfoWars and Alex Jones if I was regularly appearing on Fox. So they have done me an enormous favor. And based on my studying of the data, Andrew, you and I are reaching far more people right now than CNN or Fox in this same time frame. So in, in, in essence, um, they, what, these attacks on us have only made us stronger. Uh, I understood that Mr. Brock was trying to seek some formal role uh, in deciding what is fake news. And that's laughable because virtually everything he and his twisted little psycho fans at Media Matters crank out is the fake news. They are the purveyors of fake news. They may be the inventors of fake news. What say you? Yeah, um, I hear you. It's it's backfired dramatically. I, I honestly think that if it wasn't for uh, David Brock's uh, just conglomerate of organizations, aggressively targeting conservative viewpoints on the internet, then uh, Hillary Clinton may have won. I think that it, it, it totally backfired. And it's uh, it, it's kind of hysterical to see him trying to do the same exact thing without, you know, obviously he hasn't learned his lesson. But um, you know, on the other end though, a large majority of Americans, a, a significant percentage of Americans get their news from Facebook and Twitter. So, you know, whether or not people would like the news that is being produced by alternative media sources such as uh, Infowars, what Media Matters is trying to do is to just make those posts, those links to any alternative news sites just not show up at all. So even if somebody wants to see that news, see that insight, they, they I mean, how, how can you find something if you don't even know what you're, what you're looking for? So they just want to, you know, contain the echo chamber and keep their echo chamber in, in, in place instead of allowing communication to happen between the two opposing uh, uh, political ideals in this country. It, what's particularly interesting to me is given David Brock's long record of ineffectiveness and the fact that he spent a huge amount of money and achieved virtually nothing, particularly given the enormous built-in institutional advantages of his candidate, I can't wa imagine why any rich liberal would give him 10 cents. In fact, if I were George Soros, I'd be demanding a refund. This guy's an incompetent. He lets his boyfriend run the organization by and large. He has uh, been caught cheating on his taxes. Look, I owe the IRS some money, but I have a payment plan and I pay them every month and it hurts, I assure you. But Mr. Brock is not in that situation as has been widely reported. So uh, look, I, I think that he's breaking multiple laws. I think uh, it's perfectly understandable why the Obama Justice Department hasn't looked at him. Uh, but if we're really going to have equal protection under the law, then frankly, I think he should be brought to justice, not for his political ideas, but for the, for the fact that he's cheating and that he's violating federal election laws in this incredible effort to smear and call people names. In all honesty, I'm, being, I'm tired of being called a racist. I was out working against the racist Rockefeller drug laws in uh, New York State before David Brock was in long pants. I was helping Richard Nixon desegregate the public schools without violence before David Brock was, uh, was uh, a gleam in his father's eye. So um, this name calling, bigot, racist, and so on, it, it is what the left does when they can't refute your ideas 
with facts. It, it is really beneath uh, our national political dialogue. That's my view. Where do you think Mr. Brock goes from here, Andrew? Because I know you are wisely keeping a very close eye on him. Well, um, about six months ago, I started looking into his organizations because uh, it, all of a sudden, you know, there was this, all this astroturfing online. Um, it looked like paid comments, you know, uh, pro Hillary Clinton comments online. And it turns out that uh, David Brock's, uh, one of his super PACs, Correct the Record, was uh, essentially correcting Hillary Clinton's record online. And they were out in the open saying that, hey, we're a super PAC, but since we don't make any paid advertisements on TV or on the radio, we just stick with online communications, we can directly coordinate with the Clinton campaign. So we can wait for orders from the top and then you know, distribute the message on, on internet forums uh, across the internet, creating this false illusion that a lot of people like Hillary Clinton when that just wasn't the case. So you know, that goes to you know, backfiring against what his intentions were. But the, the problem here and what, what I'm looking into, uh, my, my investigation is trying to unravel the complex relationship between his uh, you know, up to 14 separate entities that are all sharing office space with Media Matters in, in downtown Washington, D.C. And it's extremely complex. And we talk about you know, submitting an official complaint. Well, the problem is on the right, there isn't really much infrastructure for, you know, for groups that focus on litigation against uh, liberal groups that may be breaking the law. There's, there's no real, you know, there's, there's not a, a network of, of organizations that focus on, on that type of thing. The Federal Election Commission is completely incompetent. They, they have no idea how to enforce the current laws, period. It, they regularly deadlock. Whenever an, org an organization will ask the Federal Election Commission, hey, is it okay if we can do this? And they'll spend a year working on the decision and they'll come back saying, it's a 3-3 split, we don't know. So we're just not gonna issue a ruling on it. So they don't know how to enforce the law. The IRS is clearly compromised. They put way too much focus on conservative groups, watchdog and conservative groups, but they don't even look at, um, at liberal groups. So it's just a, a system of incompetence to where nobody knows how to enforce the law, period. And so what David Brock is doing, in, in my view, is getting away with as much as possible out in the open. And he's protected by none other than just the complex relationship between multiple nonprofits, foundations, and super PACs all working together under one, you know, it's, it's really just one single entity, but they claim to be 14 separate related organizations. And my most recent research is focused on analyzing you know, cost sharing agreements between the separate organizations and issues that are surrounding that. And it's, it's a very big story, but it's just so hard to talk about because it's just so complicated. Um, and, uh, and so that's, that's what I've been looking into. I, I think that if the work on my site, the citizens audit uh, gets out uh, and we have, you know, and we start a conversation around the operations of media matters and the relationship with political entities, it would be a very big issue for, for David Brock because there's a, a significant amount of just concerning things that, that they're doing with their money that at the very least should trigger the IRS to come in, take a look at their books and determine, hey, should Media Matters be a charitable organization? You know, we should, I, I believe that, that they have lost um, any reason to be designated as a, as a charitable organization. That should be revoked and they should be liable for, for back taxes for all the time that they've been um, claiming to be a charitable organization, but in reality, just operating like a political organization. Yeah, they've clearly violated uh, their current tax status and they should be held liable. You may remember back when I published my book, The uh, Clinton's War on Women, which was the definitive oppo dump on Bill, Hillary, and Chelsea Clinton and their various illegal activities. There was a major effort to invade the Amazon.com page to lay a disproportionate number of one star and no star uh, reviews of my book. Most of them we were able to track back to Brock and his minions. Now on Amazon, there's evidence that this is beginning again, pertaining to my new book, uh, The Making of the President uh, 2016, How Donald Trump Orchestrated an American Revolution. So this is as good a time as any to ask folks who are tuned in today, who like the book, 
please go to Amazon and leave a, a uh, an objective review uh, for others to see. This is more important than you might think because uh, the wholesale book retailers and others monitor Amazon very closely to see what the reviews look like before they decide to order. Uh, I think we have our our music here. Uh, if somebody can uh, show me the clock, we can uh, see what we've got here. But I want to thank you, uh, Andrew, for the work you're doing at Citizens Audit uh, and the excellent job you have been done. You are doing focusing on David Brock. Welcome back to Infowars. I'm Roger Stone, sitting in for Alex Jones. This is a very good time to remind you that freedom isn't free. Uh, and that the very fine products at the Infowar store are really what fund this effort to bring you the real news and to bring you the first-rate investigative journalism of people like uh, Paul Joseph Watson, Dr. Jerome Corsi, and so many others. Uh, my wife, uh, who is very uh, uh, intent on not only oral health but having a gleaming smile, is an enormous fan of the super blue fluoride toothpaste that you can now get again at the Infowars.com store. Now, this has been sold out for months, but now it's available again. And research across the board indicates that this does more than just cosmetic value. This has a health value because healthy gums contribute uh, to uh, overall health and help prevent both heart disease and heart attacks. When bacteria infects your gums, it can actually enter the bloodstream and therefore contribute to blood clots or heart attacks. I must tell you, Mrs. Stone is very, very particular about the oral products that she uses, and she swears by Super Blue Fluoride Toothpaste. So here's a chance for a win-win situation. You can get a product on the InfoWars store, in this case, Super Blue Fluoride Free Toothpaste, and you can help the revolution. There are literally hundreds of testimonials from people about the efficacy of this product. So please, grab it now. Uh, I'm going to buy some of the new caveman formula, although I'm afraid they might start calling me that if I do. Uh, in any event, please, go to the site. You can buy this terrific product. And frankly, it's also the best place to get your copy of The Making of the President 2016, How Donald Trump Orchestrated an American Revolution. Now, as is widely known, I have pledged to sign the book of everyone who buys the book here at InfoWars. And yes, that pledge is still good. And yes, my wrist hurts. And yes, I am signing thousands of uh, book plates a day. And your commitment, your fulfillment will come. I beg your indulgence. I beg your patience. I had no idea that the book would sell this widely on InfoWars. But I want everyone who is an InfoWars watcher or listener to get this special edition signed by me. I understand Alex Jones is going to sign many of these books as well. I want this to be a, a special thanks to those who loyally follow InfoWars. Why? Because you are the backbone of the Trump revolution. Because you are on the cutting edge of stopping the globalists. You deserve uh, the, the accolades uh, of your fellow patriots. And if you will buy this book at InfoWars, even though it's available elsewhere, um, I pledge to you, even though it may take some time, you will get your personally autographed uh, a copy of the book, something I hope that you will share with your friends and family. Um, there is no place like InfoWars when it comes to the real news. We're in a struggle, folks, a struggle for the future of Western civilization, a struggle for our freedoms. You have seen in the last 48 hours the extent to which the two-party duopoly and the insiders who have driven this country into the gutter are prepared to smear and violate the law. So I say, God bless Alex Jones, God bless our president, uh, Donald J. Trump, and God bless you for following InfoWars and being the tip 
of the spear when it comes to the resistance.